Hi, I am Marius Venter. I am the director of the Center for Local Economic Development in the College of Business and Economics at the University of Johannesburg. I am also the director of Pascal Africa, an international research network. I established the Center for Local Economic Development in 2008 with the vision of creating a career path for persons working in local economic development. I am the editor of a new book called Learning for a Better Future, Perspectives on Higher Education, Cities, Business and Civil Society. This scholarly book aims to demonstrate how a combination of globalization, pandemics and the impact of innovation and technologies are driving us towards a world in which traditional ideas are being challenged. This book is timely because of major recent developments in each of these contexts. For example, rethinking the role of universities, their relationships with other stakeholders, such as business, civil society and policymakers, rethinking the interface between urban and rural areas, and building connections at various levels that will facilitate and support the aspirations of individuals. The book introduces new concepts that attempt to bridge this rapidly changing mix, such as building entrepreneurial learning cities, the sustainable development goals, the fourth industrial revolution, digital transformation, and the COVID-19 pandemic. The book carries forward a dual context and relevance to South African social, educational, economic and cultural development and the broader international context and action directed towards how lifelong learning for all can be fostered in communities as a foundation for a just, human-centered, sustainable world. Now, this book consists of three parts. Part one consists of chapter one and two. Part two, chapters three and four. Part three, chapters five to 11. Chapter one was written by Sir Peter Kearns from Australia, progressing towards a good human-centered sustainable society. In this chapter, Peter demonstrates that the world is currently at the crossover of radical changes happening in society, primarily brought about by the corona disease, COVID-19 pandemic. Rapid technological advances, such as automation, artificial intelligence, and aging populations with better longevity. The chapter explores the state of balanced holistic development across key dimensions of sustainability, specifically in relation to happiness and well-being, the implications for Africa, the role of universities connecting urban and rural areas in sustainable development, and overcoming confusion and disconcerting global trends in building a good, sustainable future, mainly the challenges of being human in the era of the fourth industrial revolution. Chapter 2, Sustainable Healthy Learning Cities and Neighbourhoods. In this chapter, my colleagues from the University of Glasgow looks at case study research conducted in two cities in each of the seven countries in the Global South. Based on an analysis of data drawn from planning and urban development policy documents, in the respective countries over the past two decades. These case studies identify key ideas and policies that have shaped the delivery of public services and health and education. Chapter three. My colleagues from the University of KwaZulu-Natal looks at the role of local economic development agencies and non-profit organizations in local economic development. They pose a few case studies. Local economic development 
agencies and non-profit organizations are discussed as important role players to mobilize and stimulate local economic development. The most important contribution of local economic development agencies and non-profit associations are the creation of positive partnerships that could lead to an increase in productivity with sustainable outcomes. Chapter 4, Prof. Peter Bauer from the University of Johannesburg discusses global institutional behavior in the market for fine art, exploring art and innovation at the core of globalization. He looks how prices are determined in the international art market in terms of a behavioral economics model. This chapter explores the level of market efficiency that exists within the market for fine art and highlights the relationship that exists between the international art price and the demand for art in the local market. Chapter 5. Pivoting higher education and training towards agility and flexibility in critical times. Now, this chapter seeks to highlight three critical issues that are disruptors to higher education and which underpin the necessity for higher education to pivot towards agility and flexibility in order to survive and grow in the face of major changes. These three critical issues are the impact of the fourth and even the fifth industrial revolution the changing world of work and jobs, and the impact of the global coronavirus disease 2019. The view presented in the chapter is that new realities will emerge out of the richness of collaboration and cooperation between people using appropriate tools and approaches for a truly and co-created higher education ecosystem. Chapter 6, Shifting Economies and the Need for New Skills. In this chapter, Professor Swanepoel identified a range of skills that would be required of employees working in industries that have adopted the disruptive technology of the fourth industrial revolution. Firstly, the concept of the fourth industrial revolution is defined and its opportunities and challenges are highlighted. This is followed by a discussion of relevant skills demanded by the fourth industrial revolution, namely technical work readiness, human, soft skills, and entrepreneurial skills. The chapter concludes with the recommendation that to comply with the skills demands of the fourth industrial revolution, an integrated approach to skills development would have to be adopted among educators, government and business, including addressing adult learning. The individual would have to develop a mindset of lifelong learning for continued employability. Chapter 7. Learning for a better future. Perspectives on higher education cities, business, and civil society. In this chapter, Pete Crocomp pronounces higher education as a universal concept that is due for revision in methodology as well as philosophy. Technological innovation seems to be driving the awareness that existing models impose an extraordinary financial burden on the middle class and in the case of South Africa, inhibit access to higher education. The current institutional model has for millennia been the universal method of transferring knowledge. This model is largely driven by public spending and delivers a standard product to the market. However, the needs of the market are dynamic and the change required outputs demanded of higher education. This involves great cost. It does make sense to involve actors within the economy at an 
early stage of the educational process. The conclusion of ProComp is that the complicated nature of both these variables, cost as well as spatial relocation, could be resolved by business taking on the responsibility to realign the method of knowledge transfer. Chapter 8. Rethinking the post-school education and training system to prepare the workforce for the fourth industrial revolution, world of work. The fourth industrial revolution, together with the coronavirus disease, has forced countries across the globe into a new reality that has fundamentally altered the way we live, work and relate to one another. Within this context, the chapter investigates the implications for preparing the workforce for the new world of work and the need to rethink and redesign elements of South Africa's post-school and education training system, the PSET system. The chapter presents the view that these changes require a fundamental rethink of the systems, processes and the practices relating to the occupation-directed education and training programs offered by public and private entities in the PSET sector. Chapter 9. Digital credentials, discussions on fluency, data privacy, and the recognition of learning in higher education beyond COVID-19. Credentials have historically been thought of as tangible documents, such as a driver's license, a passport or a birth certificate. In the educational sector, a credential can be something like a degree certificate or a school leaving certificate. It is customary in contemporary society that an individual proves his or her identity or achievements by sharing a credential in one way or another. The advent of the coronavirus disease 2019, also known as COVID-19, and in fact even many new developments during the months preceding the pandemic, has starkly illustrated that digital credentials are not only useful, but also necessary for global citizenship and mobility. This chapter proposes the development of a national digital ecosystem for the post-schooling sector in order to build a case for the responsible use of digital credentials for the recognition of learning beyond the COVID-19 pandemic. The chapter specifically positions the concept of self-sovereign identity as a key consideration for the education sector in the new digital age. Chapter 10, Rationale for the Internationalization of Higher Education. This chapter presents a dimensional and multivariate internationalization conceptual framework for higher education. The framework offers various development discourse options to higher education institutions for pursuing local, international, and global educational reputation and aspirations. The framework facilitates decision-making on a preferred interna internationalization profile, given the contextual realities in which particular higher education institutions operate, their institutional missions and values, the local circumstances, and their aspirations to be globally relevant. In the last chapter, Rob Mark looked at promoting age-friendly universities that engage new groups of older adults. Universities have the potential to bridge disciplinary and geographic barriers to overcome the intellectual compartmentalization that has often impeded later life learning. 
research and practice. In this chapter, a vision is outlined for later life learning within the university using the concept and strategic focus of the age-friendly university. The chapter lists the foundational elements of 10 age-friendly university design principles, illustrating how implementation of these design principles has transformed the universities to become lifelong learning universities for students of all ages. In conclusion, this book is action oriented in its recommendations and seeks to empower scholars to implement or explore local development in their communities and work environments across subjects such as higher education, the Sustainable Development Goals, promoting lifelong learning opportunities for all, fostering cultural relations between cities, supporting the UNESCO call to action in building green, healthy learning cities, promoting happiness and well-being, and generally encouraging partnerships for local development. Thank you.